Happy Tuesday, everyone. Mr. Lowers here. Um, today, we are doing something very exciting. We are starting our next read aloud together with the book, The One and Only Ivan. Uh, the three of us teachers, we've been so excited to read this with you guys. Um, we were obviously hoping to do it in person, but with how things are turning out, we decided that we're going to start it with videos now. All right, so uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, one of us is going to upload a video of us reading the next part of this book. Something that's really interesting about this book is the layout of it. Um, if you kind of open to the beginning, you would expect there to be a table of contents somewhere, but there are actually no chapters in this book. So that's something that we're going to think about as we move forward with it, maybe why the author decided to write this book this way. Um, you'll also see over here that it's going to become a movie at some point in the future. So look out for that, so that way you can kind of compare and contrast the book and the movie like we did for Win dixie um, We hope that you enjoy this book as much as we enjoy it. I'm going to start by reading the blurb on the back so you can kind of get an idea of what this book is going to be about. And then I'm going to get started and read the first 25 pages for us today. All right. Um, by the way, once I'm done reading, I would like you guys to go outside and do something active. It's been some beautiful weather recently, so make sure that you're um, taking advantage of that. All right. So this says, Ivan is an easygoing gorilla. Living in a shopping mall, he has grown accustomed to humans watching him through the glass walls of his domain. He rarely misses his life in the jungle. In fact, he hardly ever thinks about it at all. Instead, Ivan thinks about TV shows he's seen, his friends Stella and Bob, and painting. Then he meets Ruby, a baby elephant taken from her family, and she makes Ivan see their home, and his own art, through new eyes. When Ruby arrives, change comes with her, and it's up to Ivan to make it a change for the better. Alright, something I'm going to ask you guys to do, the three of us are going to ask you guys to do, um, as we read this, is to pause the video and talk about maybe a question we ask or your thoughts about what's going on to someone around you. Um, this is our version of a turn and talk since we can't be there with you guys. So hopefully, maybe if you have a sibling around and you want to, if they're listening, you can talk to them about your thoughts or about the questions we ask. Or if your parents are around, you can talk to them. If you don't have anybody around, that's completely fine. Just kind of think about it in your head. And we're going to give you some time to pause and reflect on the questions asked and your thoughts on the book, okay? So... Um, what I want you guys to do first is just give a quick prediction to somebody around you or in your head about what you think is going to happen after Ruby the baby elephant comes. Because it, it, it does say that um, she helps Ivan see their home in a new way and that change is coming. So um, go ahead, pause the video, talk about it, and then we'll get started. Alright, so now we are back. Let's get started. Um, so like I was saying earlier, there aren't any chapters in here. The weird thing, though, is that at some of the pages, there'll be a word or a little blurb at the top. And um, as we read through this book, I kind of want you to think about why the author did that. Okay, so the first one up here just says, hello. I am Ivan. I am a gorilla. It's not as easy as it looks. See, look, we got another one over here, another one up here. So this one over here says names. People call me the Freeway Gorilla, the Ape at Exit 8, the one and only Ivan, Mighty Silverback. The names are mine, but they are not me. I'm Ivan, just Ivan, only Ivan. Humans waste words. They toss them like banana peels and leave them to rot. Everyone knows the peels are the best part. I suppose you think gorillas can't understand you. Of course. You probably also think we can up, walk, walk upright. Try knuckle walking for an hour. You tell me, which way is more fun? I've learned, oh, we got patience over here. I've learned to understand human words over the years, but understanding human speech is not the same as understanding humans. Humans speak too much. They chatter like chimps, crowding the world with their noise even when they have nothing to say. It took me some time to recognize all those human sounds, to weave words into things, but I was patient. Patient is a useful way to be when you're an ape. Gorillas are as patient as stones. Humans, not so much. How I look. I used to be a wild gorilla, and I still look the part. 
I have a gorilla's shy gaze, a gorilla's sly smile. I wear a snowy saddle of fur, the uniform of a silverback. When the sun warms my back, I cast a gorilla's majestic shadow. In my size, humans see a test of themselves. They hear fighting words on the wind, when all I'm thinking is how the late day sun reminds me of a ripe nectarine. I'm mi mightier than any human, 400 pounds of pure power. My body looks made for battle. My arms outstretched span taller than the tallest human. My family tree spreads wide as well. I am a great ape, and you are a great ape, and so are chimpanzees, and orangutans, and bonobos, all of us distant and distrustful cousins. I know this is troubling. I, too, find it hard to believe there is a connection across time and space, linking me to a race of ill-mannered clowns. Chimps. There's no excuse for them. The Exit 8 Big Top Mall in Video Arcade. I live in a human habitat called the Exit 8 Big Top Mall in Video Arcade. We are conveniently located off I-95 with shows at 2, 4, and 7, 365 days a year. Max says, Max says that when he answers the trilling telephone. Mac works here at the mall. He is the boss. I work here too. I am the gorilla. At the Big Top Mall, a creaky music carousel spins all day, and monkeys and parrots live amid the merchants. In the middle of the mall is a ring with benches where humans can sit on their rumps while they eat soft pretzels. The floor is covered with sawdust made of dead trees. My domain is at one end of the ring. I live here because I am too much gorilla and not enough human. Stella's domain is next to mine. Stella is an elephant. She and Bob, who is a dog, are my dearest friends. At present, I do not have any gorilla friends. My domain is made of thick glass and rusty metal and rough cement. Stella's domain is made of metal bars. The sun bear's domain is wood, the parrot's is wire and mesh. Three of my walls are glass. One of them is cracked, and a small piece about the size of my hand is missing from its bottom corner. I made the hole with a baseball mat uh, with a baseball bat Matt gave me for my sixth birthday. After that, he took the bat away, but he let me keep the baseball that came with it. A jungle scene is painted on one of my domain walls. It has a waterfall without water, and flowers without scent, and trees without roots. I didn't paint it, but I enjoy the way the shapes flow across my wall, even if it isn't much of a jungle. I am lucky my domain has three windowed walls. I can see the whole mall and a bit of the world beyond. The frantic pinball machines, the pink billows of cotton candy, the vast and treeless parking lot. Beyond the lot is a freeway where a car stampede without end. A giant sign at its edge beckons them to stop and rest like gazelles at a watering hole. The sign is faded, the color is bleeding, but I know what it says. Mac read, it, uh, read its words aloud one day. Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan, Mighty Silverback. Sadly, I cannot read, although I wish I could. Reading stories would make a fine way to fill my empty hours. Once, however, I was able to enjoy a book left in my domain by one of the keepers. It tasted like termite. The freeway billboard has a drawing of Mac in his clown clothes and Stella on her hind legs and an angry animal with fierce eyes and unkept hair. That animal is supposed to be me, but the artist made a mistake. I am never angry. So you can see the billboard right here. It kind of makes Ivan seem like he's this just crazy predator who's about ready to eat the uh, his keeper when he knows that he is never angry. So I think this would be a good point to stop and talk about something that we as um, a grade have been focusing on in the last couple weeks of school before um, the coronavirus happened, and that is perspective and point of view. Um, as I read the rest of this chapter, I want to think I want you to think about the point of view being used, whether it's first person, which is when a character in the story is telling the story or a third person, there's a narrator telling the story. Think about that, and then also think about the perspective. Um, if you guys remember back to um, our Mrs. LaRue books with our, do our favorite dog, Ike, um, he had, it, we, we, we kind of were reading the story from his perspective, and that really changed the way that we viewed the story. 
But we also learn that if you look at the story from somebody else's perspective, a different character in the story, the story can drastically change. All right, so think about point of view and perspective as we finish this chapter. All right, anger is precious. A silverback uses anger to maintain order and warn his troop of danger. When my father beat his chest, it was to say, Beware, listen, I am in charge. I am angry to protect you because that is what I was born to do. Here is my domain. There is no one to protect. The littlest big top on earth. My neighbors here at the Big Top Mall know many tricks. They are an educated lot, more accomplished than I am. One of my neighbors plays baseball, although she is a chicken. Another drives a fire truck, although he is a rabbit. I used to have a neighbor, a sleek and thoughtful seal, who could balance a ball on her nose from dawn till dusk. Her voice was like a th the throaty bark of a dog chained outside on a cold night. Children wished on pennies and tossed them into her plastic pool. They glowed on the bottom like flat copper stones. The seal was hungry one day, or bored perhaps, so she ate 100 pennies. Max said she'd be fine. He was mistaken. Max calls our show the littlest big top on earth. Every day at 2, 4, and 7, humans, humans fan themselves, drink sodas, applaud. Baby's whale, Mac dressed like a clown, pedals on a tiny bike. A dog named Snickers rides on Stella's back. Stella sits on a stool. It is a very sturdy stool. I don't do any tricks. Mac says it's enough for me to be me. Stella told me that some circuses move from town to town. They have humans who dangle on ropes, twining from the tops of tents. They have grumbling lions with gleaming teeth and a snaking line of elephants, each cl uh, clutching the limp tail in front of her. The elephants look far off into the distance so they won't see the humans who want to see them. Our circus doesn't migrate. We sit where we are, like an old beast too tired to push on. After our show, humans forage through the stores, a store where humans buy things they need to survive. At the Big Top Mall, some stores sell new things, like balloons and t-shirts and caps to cover the gleaming hands of humans. Some stores sell old things, things that smell dusty and damp and long forgotten. All day, I watch humans scurry from store to store. They pass their green paper, dry as old leaves and smelling of a thousand hands, back and forth and back again. They hunt frantically, stalking, pushing, grumbling. Then they leave, clutching bags filled with things. Bright things, soft things, big things. No matter how full the bags, they always come back for more. Humans are clever indeed. They spend pink clouds you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls. But they are lousy hunters. It's really interesting, I think, kind of listening to um, Ivan describe what he's seeing. Because he says right here, humans are clever indeed. They spin pink clouds you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls. It's really, I don't know, it's kind of fascinating to listen to. What do you think that he's talking about? They spin pink clouds you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls. So that's kind of something. When you're listening to this book, you really need to think about the way Ivan is seeing things because how he sees things are different than how we see things. When he says pink clouds you can eat, we automatically, like we nobody would ever say that. We would just say cotton candy. Or they build domains with flat waterfalls. And he's just talking about somebody painting a wall a waterfall on a wall. So keep thinking about how he's describing things and then how we as humans view things. <clears throat> Gone. Some animals live privately, unwatched, but that is not my life. My life is flashing lights and pointing fingers and uninvited visitors. Inches away, humans flatten their little hands against the wall of glass that separates us. The glass says you are this and we are that and that is how it will always be. Humans leave their fingerprints behind, sticky with candy, slick with sweat. Each night, a weary man comes to wipe them away. Sometimes I press my nose against the glass. My nose print, like your fingerprint, is the first and last and only one. The man wipes the glass and then I am gone. Artists. Here is my domain. I do not have much to do. You can only throw so many me balls at humans before you get bored. A me ball is made up by rolling or is made by rolling up dung until it's the size of a small apple, then letting it dry. I always keep a few on hand. When he says dung, anybody know what that means? 
He's actually referring to his own poop. Kind of gross, I know. So he's saying that he he rolls them up into small balls, lets them dry, and then throws them at humans. I guess you got to do something to entertain yourself in a, in a cage all day. For some reason, my visitors never seem to carry any. In my domain, I have a tire swing, a baseball, a tiny plastic pool filled with dirty water, and even an old TV. I have a stuffed toy gorilla, too. Julia, the daughter of the weary man who cleans the mall each night, gave it to me. The gorilla has empty eyes and floppy limbs, but I sleep with it every night. I call it not Tag. Tag was my twin sister's name. Julia is 10 years old. She has hair like black glass and a wide half-moon smile. She and I have a lot in common. We are both great apes, and we are both artists. It was Julia who gave me my first crayon, a stubby blue one, slipped it through the broken spot in my glass along with a folded piece of paper. I knew what to do with it. I'd watch Julia draw. When I dragged the crayon across the paper, it left a trail in its wake like a slithering blue snake. Julia's drawings are wild with color and movement. She draws things that aren't real, clouds that smile and cars that swim. She draws until her crayons break and her paper rips. Her pictures are like pieces of a dream. I can't draw dreamy pictures. I never remember my dreams, although sometimes I awaken with my fists clenched and my heart hammering. My drawings seem pale and timid next to Julia's. She draws the ideas in her head. I draw the things in my cage. Simple items that fill my days. An apple core, a banana, a, a banana peel, a candy wrapper. I often eat my subjects before I draw them. But even though I draw the same things over and over again, I never get bored with my art. When I'm drawing, that's all I think about. I don't think about where I am, about yesterday or tomorrow. I just move my crayons across the paper. Humans don't always seem to recognize what I've drawn. They squint, cock their heads, murmur. I'll draw a banana, a perfectly lovely banana, and they'll say, It's a yellow airplane, or it's a duck without wings. That's all right. I'm not drawing for them. I'm drawing for me. Max soon realized that people will pay for a picture made by a gorilla, even if they don't know what it is. Now I draw every day. My works sell for $20 a piece, 25 with frame, at the gift shop near my domain. If I get tired and need a break, I eat my crayons. Shapes and Clouds I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby, still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures in the tumbled stones at the bottom of a stream. I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of, the re or just out of reach, the ebony birds streaking past. I don't remember much about my early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got the chance, I would dip my fingers into cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination Someday, I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining worlds that don't yet exist. I know what most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations. They think we don't remember our past or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly, I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. The loneliest gorilla in the world. When the Big Top Mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay, and humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on a lazy river. Lately, a day might go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. It's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass. They cluck their tongues. They frown while I watch my TV. He looks lonely, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said, clutching his mother's hand. At times like that, I wish humans could understand me the way I can understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With enough time, you can get used to almost anything. TV my visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac put in my domain. They seem to find it odd, the sight of a gorilla staring at tiny humans in a box. Sometimes I wonder, though, isn't the way they stare at me, sitting in my tiny box, just as strange? 
My TV is old. It doesn't always work, and sometimes days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of cartoons with their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when someone slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV almost as, almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I have seen many romance movies, too. In a romance, there is much hugging and sometimes face licking. I have yet to see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old western movies. In a western, someone always says, This town ain't big enough for the bo both of us, Sheriff. In a western, you can tell who the good guys are and the, who the bad guys are, and the good guys always win. Bob says westerns are nothing like real life. Alright, so I'm going to actually stop there for today. Um, before... I end this video I just want you guys to think about a couple things okay so like I said earlier I'm hoping that you guys are thinking about point of view and perspective and then why you think that Catherine Applegate the author decided to have these small little titles up top instead of uh, actual chapters alright so um, talk about that with someone at your house sibling a parent or just think about it if nobody is around and I'm sure that we will keep talking about that um, this idea on Thursday when Miss Bailey does the next 25 pages. I really hope that you guys enjoyed the start of this book. It only gets better and better. Um, so, like I said earlier at the beginning of this, once you're done listening to this, please get outside, enjoy the beautiful weather, be active, do something fun with your family. All right, miss you guys a ton, and I will see you soon.